we're, we're launching and we're moving into our, what we call, we typically call it our State of the Union month. This is the month where we focus primarily on dissecting, reminding ourselves, rediscovering the core values of our church, who we are and what is it that we do. Now the importance of this month for us is extremely basic and foundational for two primary reasons. And this is where we're going for the next four Sundays. The first reason is because you got to make sure that we are the institution, we are the organism, we are the entity that is connected to God. We call this salvation. So if you have never received Jesus as your personal Savior, the connection begins by trusting Christ at a personal, not necessarily individual, but personal level. And I'm saying not individual because that's the second part of, it, of the common or the, or the formula or the presentation. You connect with God personally, but then, watch this, you connect with each other. I'm going to say that one more time. You connect with God personally, and the end result of your personal relationship with God is not exclusively heaven. If the product of your salvation is Christ's likeness on earth, I am here to build an argument through the scriptures for the next four Sundays, but I do not believe you can walk, think, behave, react, see life through the lenses of Jesus Christ alone. I will even say the opposite. I think if you try to be like Jesus, to walk like Jesus, to be the presence of Jesus, the best way for you to avoid that is continue your religious life your desire to know God individually. And I mean, think about it. Most people, when we come to Christ, we're coming to Christ, and the undercurrent of this need for Christ is basically, I have been pretty much doing things on my own. Marriage counseling is nothing else but two individuals that they try to do things on their own, no counsel, no, no, no wisdom from anyone else, neither the Lord, just trust in the wrong understanding, and basically saying, we give up, we can do this alone, help us. That's what it means. So, so I'm trying for us to think about this experience of, again, connecting with God, but the connection with God is not that you are better, it's not that you avoid hell, it's not that you just are more spiritual, or watch this, it's not that you're just more Bible knowledgeable, all of those things are important, but it's how you connect with one another. So let me, let me reverse the, 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 the formula, the equation, or the conversation. You struggling with connecting with one another is the evidence that your connection with God probably is not working. More than likely. Now, why I bring this up to you? Well, one of the privileges that I have had in the last few years is to travel to different countries. And when you travel to other countries, especially in the business that I'm involved in, which is church life, unavoidably you see everything through the lenses of what you do and who you are. And as I walk into countries, I walk into places, I walk into churches, I meet with pastors, I meet with unchurched people, unavoidably, I'm always drawn to see the perception, the, the making, the functioning of the local church. And I have seen so many churches in so many contexts I have seen so many people speak about the church in so many different ways that I came to the conclusion that the church has a bad rap. We, we have a bad reputation. The church of Christ, in other words, what I want you to think about for a second is that the United States is no exception. It, 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 and Jesus is having this conversation in Matthew chapter 16 with his disciples. And, and even though it's not going to be on the screen, when you look at the Bible, and specifically the first, the first verses of the passage of this Matthew 16, and, and, if, you, and if you look at how Jesus is, is coming to explain to, to the disciples how he's bringing this conversation, I, I want to take you into verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, this is the conversation, he asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Verse 14. They replied, some say John the Baptist. Others will say that you are Elijah. And others will say that you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. In other words, what is happening is that Jesus is having this conversation to make sure that people understand who he is and who do people say that he is. Once again, I travel to other countries. I am from a foreign country. 
I am in a foreign country that has become my country. And so a lot of times I don't know exactly where I'm at and where I'm standing and where I'm going and this sense of identity culturally and you know and other things. But one thing that I continue to see over and over the place is that people are going to be confronted with a question in verse 15. What about you? Says Jesus. Who is it that you say I am? Now, going back to verse 14, they said, they went through the list, look at the Bible. They went and said John the Baptist, they went and said Elijah, they went and said Jeremiah, and then they closed the list of verse 14 by saying one of the prophets. So here's what I want you to understand this morning, because here's what I believe, the bad reputation is built in the local church is that most people, most of us, people around the world, typically they do not like the church, but they like Jesus. Most people around the world, regardless of the culture, this is my experience, going into Ethiopia, going into Somalia, going into Germany, going into Armenia, going into Belarus, going to Belize in college here. When I walk into a lot of this context and met a lot of people, I notice that people are cool with Jesus. They just don't like the church. You know, I just described some of your children and grandchildren. Some of your kids are cool with Jesus. I, people think that Jesus is cool. It's like people, most people, they don't have anything against Jesus. They, they recognize Jesus as a good person, as a good leader, as a, a, a a definitely good teacher, good mentor, but it's that understanding that most people, what they have done, and again, here's what I want you to, I want to level the ground, and this is why our conversation is important. Verse 14 is a bunch of Jewish boys called disciples that they're just given the right theological answer. That they're just given the doctrinal fill in the blank that is expected for most people without really knowing who Jesus is. And I'm concerned that some of us may be on that boat, that we just give the right answer of who Jesus is. You can recite what your mama told you Jesus was. You can just bring forth the same statement that you heard from your previous church or preacher, or the latest book that you read, and, and you process this theological, kind of a just verbatim, kind of a view of who Jesus is without really knowing who Jesus really is. So in your handout, you see how Jesus is asking them to stop just simply putting Jesus into the context of being cool, but understanding that now this is the reality. Look at verse 16. Even though the question was asked to all of them, who do you all say I am, Peter becomes the outspoken voice of the group and says, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the promised one. You are the son of the living God. Now watch, watch the language of Peter because this is the turning point of what I'm trying to help us understand. Here is where I want you to hear me speak very clearly that this is not simply a confession. This is a revelation. And, and I'm bringing this up because on your handout says, stop filling the blank if you're still blank. If, I mean, if you're like clueless about who God is, you can potentially, I mean, I walk into countries where if you, if you remember, if you kind of, again, when you think about Christianity, Armenia, which is right beside Turkey, between Turkey and Iran, Armenia is the first country historically that Christianity moved into. That was the first country that Christianity penetrated in the first century. So, so walking into some of these places where you can meet people that are way better trained than I am in, in biblical knowledge. When you walk into places where you sit down with you know, Iranian refugees and Russian refugees and they've gone through deep suffering and you try to convey this gospel that I personally this is my argument, has my argument. This is why I don't believe that prosperity gospel works. 
Because how do you preach a gospel of prosperity that if God loves you, He will prosper you and avoid suffering to these folks? And how do you convey that? You see what I'm saying? See, the gospel it is basically at its core that in human form, God dwells among us, not necessarily so we can just embrace a doctrine, but that we need to understand that the confession that Peter is making on verse 16 is literally given by the one that he professes that is the father of the one who asks, the living God. Peter is not simply given a theological statement. He's not just, again, just bringing the, 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 the repetition of how he was brought up. This is why you have to stop just filling the blank if you're still blank. Now, the, the, the argument that we're going to build for the next few weeks is that many people may not know that they're blank still, that they're clueless of this, and they're still thinking that just having some sort of, a, again, repetition is where, is where maybe people find themselves thinking that this is the answer. Look at verse 17. Let me take you into this conversation. When Jesus heard this confession, instead of just a repetition, when Jesus saw that Peter's words were beyond Peter, now he begins with a blessing. You are blessed. You are prosperous. Uh, it's, just, it's just crazy for me to read this verse because one thing that I'm going to just be open with you in, in this deal is that, and again, this is why I guess we have to talk about this. Um, if you notice Jesus' description of Peter, he's blessed. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah? And he goes on into a weird ring just a minute. Peter kept on messing up. Peter kept on doing things that were not descriptive or they were not representative of a blessed man. Ultimately, Peter is like, not Jesus. So all that I'm saying is that, you know, this selection, this anointing, and I'm bringing this up because listen to, listen, listen to the words. You are... Simon Peter, you are a son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh. This was not revealed to you by blood, but this was revealed by my Father who is in heaven. It's on your head now. This is where God reveals himself, and, and here's the beauty of the local church. The local church, which I believe is birthed through this passage, is where this is the place where God has given us himself through Jesus, but please listen. It's not simply with the purpose to take us somewhere in the future. It's not, the giving of Jesus is not so we can, so we can tolerate what is happening in the brokenness of this world and make it through and one day survive. See, when the Bible says that he's revealing himself through the church, we become home. We are the place where people can find home. But once again, I don't believe this can eventually happen or actually happen if we only focus on connecting with God and not with one another. In other words, we have to get to the place where now our relationship among ourselves is inviting to others. And Jesus basically says, your revelation is not just a theological doctrine of revelation. It's something that God directly revealed to you. So what happens with this? Here's a reason. Peter, I will tell you that you are Peter. And it is upon what you have been received by my Heavenly Father that I, I, and I want you to underline this, I, says Jesus, I will build my church. And because I'm building my church, see this is a continuance, never ending, continues, continues present. It's not something that just happened one day, but continues to happen. I will build this church. The gates of Hades will not overcome this movement. So on your handouts, just to close our conversation, this place, not just a doctrine, but this place called home, church, this place where we belong, where we find our identity, where we are connected to God and one another, this is the place where the greatest battles are fought. So, so here's what I'm going to just, again, just challenge you this morning, because this is where I want you to think about for a second. One of the reasons why we have been inviting you to join our discipleship training school 
that begins today. And you see on our, um, <clears throat> on our hallways, 